Thank you very much. There are three reasons why I returned to URI after graduating from it 30 years before I returned. One of those reasons was Rhode Island is the ocean state. Of course, an oceanographer belongs in the ocean state. The second reason is because of their motto, think big. And I love thinking big. And the third reason was because of the gentleman on my left in front of me, then president of the university, Robert Carruthers. When I learned that his, his degree was in poetry, I said, there it all goes. It all <laughs> comes together. And when we first met, I think it was love at first sight in many ways. Uh, but my story really begins a little further back in American history. And so let's go back to 1803. Uh, President Jefferson uh, had an a, a, a audacious gentleman in France by the name of uh, Napoleon who picked the wrong fight. He picked a fight with England and he lost. And he now was charged a bill to pay for the war debt. And they, they said, you, you owe us 15 million bucks. So he came to Jefferson and made the audacious offer to sell America what became known as the Louisiana Purchase. And naturally, Congress was against it. Why would we want this place? Go to the business sector and see what they're up to and ask them if they want to do it. Well, they were in the slaves trade, they were into rum, they were into anything that the Louisiana Purchase had to offer. But Jefferson, being the great leader that he was, overrode them and made it happen. And he, in that act of purchasing the Louisiana Purchase, doubled the size of America. And then he went to a couple gentlemen and an amazing Native American woman and said, could you guys go out and find out actually what I bought? And that launched what is now known in American lore as the great Lewis and Clark expedition. It should be Lewis, Clark, and Satchewea uh, of the uh, 1804, 1805, and 1806. Now, very few people would argue that what we acquired was truly phenomenal. I mean, I, uh, like Elizabeth, who gave a speech ahead of me, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers. I was born in Wichita, she was in Kansas City. You know, seems like most oceanographers come from Kansas. Because <laughs> we, we do not believe there's an ocean, okay? And so <laughs> I gotta see it. And clearly, if you spend any time in the area of the Louisiana Purchase, you know it was, a, it was a very good deal. It was four cents an acre. And that then led to amazing things. Uh, one of my favorite places growing up was going to Yellowstone, going to all the national parks. You live out west, you spend a lot of time in the national parks. And also, out of that land came resources uh, that drive the American economic engine, certainly in agriculture, mining, oil, gas, you name it. That was a byproduct of the Louisiana Purchase. So now let's jump forward to, to eight, uh, 1983, when President Reagan picked up a pen and not $15 million, the price of the pen, and, and as Elizabeth told you, signed the Law of the Sea Convention, which, like Jefferson, again doubled the size of the United States. But unlike Jefferson, he failed to launch a follow-up modern-day version of the Lewis and Clark expedition to see what we owned beneath the sea. Really, it wasn't for 18 years later Two presidents from two different parties agreed on something. What do you think? And they created, within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Office of Ocean Exploration. And they charged that office with exploring the new America. These are the two major studies that were done, the one on the left under the Clinton administration and one on the right. Uh, under the uh, Bush administration. I was a commissioner on one and a member of the other. So I served on both of those uh, study groups and naturally made sure that they reinforced ocean exploration, which they did. But why, why care? Well, we know there's some oil and gas out there. We know there's some resources out there. There's sanctuaries that need to be expanded. But more importantly, this is really what your generation is going to be staring at. 
Estimates of the World's Carrying Capacity. This is by Harvard uh, a sociobiologist who said that it, the Earth, using the land resources we have, has a carrying capacity, the ability to support 9 to 10 billion people with the following caveat that they're vegetarians. If in fact the world adopted our eating pattern, the carrying capacity of the planet to, if everyone was eating like Americans, is only two and a half billion. And we passed that, what, in 1940? So do not transplant our way of eating to the rest of the world. We don't have the ability to do it. So we have, a, as I say, Houston, we have a problem. Beyond having that problem is 95% of the human race lives on only less than 5% of the Earth's surface. We are land-loving, air-breathing, one-atmosphere critters. And we are restricted by what the Earth has to offer us to a very small surface of the, of, of the, plant, of the Earth. Yet, 95% of all the living space on Earth is in international waters and the high seas largely unexplored. And as our population continues to rise, as you saw on that curve, we're using up the very land that we're feeding people with. So those initial uh, calculations by the Harvard sociobiologist was if you, didn't, if you had the same amount of farmland. But that's in the United States. We're replacing farmland with housing tracks to house the continuing rise of our population. These curves are in opposite directions. And Mars is not the solution. There is no exit strategy for the human race. This thought of terraforming Mars, it took Earth billions of years to pull it off, and we're going to do it while that we got less than decades to pull it off. There will not be a mass migration of humans to Mars. Not going to happen. Where would you rather be? With a bubble over your head and getting radiated? No thank you. So, what's our challenge? Clearly the human race must turn to the sea as its food for the future. Another problem. Our present fisheries are based upon catching wild fish. And 90% of the large fish in the ocean we've already hunted down and killed because we're eating the top predators. We're eating the lions and the tigers and the bears of the sea. We're eating top carnivores. Therefore, we have to move away from the hunter-gatherer society that we have established at sea and do like we did on land. It was 11,000 years ago that we domesticated goats and sheep and began to cultivate wheat and corn. 11,000 years ago, the human race on land moved from a hunter-gatherer to a farming and herding culture and led to the city-states that delivered us to where we are. We must do the same in the sea. And our focus should not be on sustaining the life in the sea, but greatly introducing, increasing its productivity. On the right is where they have taken a top predator. We all eat it at our Japanese restaurants. It's called hamachi, or yellowtail sushi. It sells for $17.50 a pound wholesale compared to, to pork, which is sold at buck fifty. So it's 10 times more valuable in the marketplace. But what they did with that carnivore fish, it's a reef fish, they gave it a choice. They said, we're going to take you out of the reef, we're going to take you out in the open ocean, in the tropical regions, and the region the water is so clear, there's nothing in it. And we're going to put you in a cage where there's hardly anything naturally being provided, and we're going to give you a choice. Eat soybean or die. Marvelously, these fish are smart enough to say, well, given that option, I'll choose the soybean. But the soybean's coming from land. We now need to go away from soybean feeding them to feeding them algae grown at sea. 
But what's wonderful about it is so scalable. There is so much nothingness out there. The ability to take an area of the ocean that has virtually no productivity and dramatically increase it. So that's what we need to look at. So in 2009, our government brought two ships of exploration online. The Okeanos Explorer, which is based at Quonset Point, and my ship, the Ocean Exploration Trust's EV Nautilus, and that's because my hero was Captain Nemo when I read that book. And our mission, you couldn't, I should add, boldly go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. That's our mission. And, but we're, and so we've brought online an amazing technology to carry out that very activity. And that ship will be heading back out to sea. It just came in after seven months at sea. We're now increasing its operational tempo to, to going to sea for eight months, starting in, the next, uh, in, in 2019. But because we don't know what we're going to find, we're going literally, we're mounting the Lewis and Clark expeditions of, of modern time. We don't know what we're going to see when we turn the corner. So we have to rely upon an incredible technology base to do a couple things. One is to remove our human presence. We, we can't stay down there. And just like the movie Avatar, when we move Jake's spirit out of his physical body and put it in a Navi, a funny looking creature that was eight feet tall with blue green skin and funny ears and a tail. And in the movie, you remember when they transferred his spirit from one to the other, he got up and ran out of the room. And they thought, oh, we really screwed up here. This guy really didn't like what we did. And they caught Jake and they said, are you okay? He said, I'm fine. They said, well, why'd you run? He said, I wanted the wind in my face again. And that's because he was paralyzed by the war. He was a veteran. And his legs weren't working. Here's the point. Jake didn't care that he was in the funny thing, eight foot, I think they were pretty sexy actually, but eight foot tall things. <laughs> he had legs again. My spirit doesn't care if I'm yellow and look like that. That's my Navi. It carries my spirit because my body cannot survive at the depths I'm going. So that's the technology we've brought online, and we then do it all live. And we transmit it back to the Interspace Center, just down on the, on the lower campus, where we bring all of our explorations from the bottom of the ocean onto land, and then distribute it out to the world. To the academic world, that can then participate in it in real time, to accelerate this discovery process. Like I say, we don't have a whole lot of time. Now, a critical part of what we do is form a core of exploration. And we made some fundamental changes in Lewis and Clark. 55% of our core, his, his, his core was the core of discovery, and ours is the core of exploration. 55% of our core are women in positions of leadership and authority. Most of our expedition leaders now are women. Not only that, we want to tell the message to our children that everyone is a part of this exploratory program. We want a child to find their face in our core and know they can play. So that's critical. But then we need to reach them and working with students from the Harrington School of Telecommunications who help us every summer to take our programming not just to the academic world that can participate in the expedition, but to the kids of our country through a tremendous amount of production and intern programs. We, have a, we take an amazing number of students and teachers to see with it. You have to be at least 15. Uh, that's, blame that on the insurance companies. But we bring them out and they become mentored by our faculty. But then, at some point during the time they're at sea with us, they're going to be put in the hot seat. So here we are preparing the team in the library, getting them ready, and then showtime. And we will be showcasing every member of our Corps. There's no escaping it. 
And in fact, I have to admit that the young lady in the middle is my daughter, <laughs> Emily Rose with a button nose, uh, who's, who went to sea with me when she's 15, she's now 20. And like my wife, who's a television producer, my daughter's majoring in telecommunications and media, uh, so the fruit did not fall far from the tree. And then the key is to then do it wave after wave after wave after wave. And so we hope some of you in the room will apply to become a part of the core, and we do it in a very broad-based uh, areas of, the, it, we not only do STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we do STEAM. What's science if it's not through skilled people like uh, President Carruthers go and hit your heart as well? So the arts are as important to our program as the science and engineering. And so I hope a lot of the students in the room will go to our website and apply to be interns, and I can guarantee you, you'll enjoy your time at sea. Thank you very much.